Namaskar and welcome everyone for this fifth lecture in our series, India, Our Mother, hosted by Sri Aurobindo Society as part of its ongoing celebrations for the 150th birth anniversary of Sri Aurobindo. This series of lectures is jointly organized by Oro Bharti, Society's Vertical for Studies in Indian Culture, and Oro Yagna, the vertical dedicated to integral yoga. And I'm joined by my colleagues Shweta and Shivaram from Oro Yagna and Biswajita from Oro Bharti. And we welcome you all for this event. Um, today's lecture is a special offering to celebrate Oroville's Foundation Day, which is tomorrow, February 28th. Um, as we know, Oroville was inaugurated on February 28th, 1968, and this is a living experiment in human unity. The divine's dream, if you will, a city of dawn at the service of truth. So to mark the 54th birthday of Oroville, we have with us a very special guest today, Sri Manoj Pavitranji from Oroville, who will be sharing with us some thoughts on Sri Aurobindo's vision of human unity. This month of February, um, of course, is a very special month for all who have turned to Mother and Sri Aurobindo. And it has also been a very special month for our lecture series here at Sri Aurobindo Society. So we started off this month with a delightful sharing by Arvinda Neelakandanji on the topic of divine feminine. And we come to a close of this month with the deliberation on the ideal of human unity as envisioned by Sri Aurobindo. And this topic gains really a much greater significance uh, in the backdrop of the events that are happening in the world around us these days. And as we know, in his famous five dreams, um, Sri Aurobindo's message of five dreams that was broadcast on the eve of Indian Independence Day in 1947, he had spoken of human unity. That was the third dream that uh, is there in that document. And he talked about unification as a necessity of nature and inevitable movement, something that is in the interest of all nations. And then he went on to say that only human imbecility and stupid selfishness can prevent it. But these cannot stand forever against the necessity of nature and the divine will. So I'm sure we are all looking forward to reflecting more on this inevitable movement and the necessity of nature and the divine will toward human unity in this next hour or so. So may I now request uh, Dr. Shivram Prasad to briefly introduce our guest for this event. Namaste. Manoj Pavitran Da is an integral yoga practitioner and educator. He started exploring integral yoga in 1989, right after graduating as a production engineer. He did postgraduate studies in product design from National Institute of Design, NID, Ahmedabad in 1993. After a short period of working as professional design consultant, he quit the profession and joined Auroville in 1995 to immerse in integral yoga and collective evolution. Manoj Da is a co-founder of the Purnam Center for Integrality in Auroville, where he offers transformative educational courses. Using 3D motion graphics, he has made videos to share the vision and work of Sri Aurobindo. Mention must be made of the film series called Evolution Fast, Fast Forward, which can be found at www.sopanam.org. He has authored a book, Pilgrims of the Infinite. We are delighted to, him, to have him with us today to share his thoughts on the topic, Sri Aravindu's vision of human unity. Thank you. Thank you, Shivaram and uh, Manojji, welcome. And please, uh, it's all yours now. Look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Greetings from Oroville on this special birthday week. 
21st is mother's birthday, 28th is Aurora's birthday. And this week is the most special period of uh, our lives here. And I'm very happy to share and dwell on Sri Aurobindo's vision of human unity on this special day, special week. The notion of Vasudeva Kudumbakam is ancient. India always saw this, earth as one family. Now, time has come. We know now the world has become so closely knit Technology has connected us all. It has become a world civilization. And it's very easy to assume that we have become one family. Even the recent events itself is a good indicator where we are. There is a very interesting quote from Mr. Wilson who said, uh, the problem with humanity is that uh, we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and God-like technology. And with technology and its immense power that can act globally, it's at the fingertips of people who are not necessarily looking at the world from the perspective of Vasudeva Kudumpaka. Now that's a big problem, big challenge. The human nature is still pretty much primitive with its territoriality, it's constant fighting instincts. At the same time, as Sri Aurobindo has traced the evolutionary journey on earth, there is a, an increasing aggregation of collectives. Even when we say start from the very fundamental particle level itself. Subatomic particles coming together and forming atoms, atoms coming together forming molecules and molecules coming together to form cells, cells coming together to become a species. There is a, an increasing aggregation coming together towards a larger oneness. And many organisms coming together and becoming a collective being like human being. When I say human being, even when I look at myself or any of us, we are a collection of many, many organisms which we don't even realize. Even the just our gut bacteria alone is like an ecosystem in itself. But we don't feel like we are a multiplicity of many, a collection of separate, separate life forms. Every individual feel like I am a whole one person. Now, up to that, we can feel that this is one person. And further the clans and from clans to nation formations, and now Sri Aurobindo is referring to the community of nations coming together. That process of aggregation leading towards a global civilization. So one thing that is visible in the process of nature is that uh, whenever a higher level of aggregation emerges, the previous stages are not dissolved and dis dispersed off. So, 
atoms are there, molecules are there, cells are there, and all the you know, individuals, families, clans, and so are the nations. It is very tempting to imagine that uh, that evolutionary stage we have reached. We have gone beyond nations to the global civilization where nations will dissolve and become one collectivity. Now this is where uh, a deeper picture is required where what will be the role of nations and what will be the real essence of nations. And it is in this space Yervindu brought in a, an incredible view of the nation souls. Now, it's important to see this from the point of your first understanding individual and individual discovering the soul of the individual. Say, let's say, in the normal conditions, an average human being is trapped in the ego, which has this deep sense of separation. And it is only when that individual wakes up and look inward to connect with the soul and discover the soul within. It is that soul that brings the sense of oneness, connection with others as a sacred relationship and a mutual self-giving that becomes spontaneous and natural. And it is only on that basis unity can be built. Otherwise, we have egos and its sense of separation struggling to cooperate or impose themselves upon each other. And we have a forced kind of, we cannot say collaboration, but cooperating under heavy external pressures for practical necessities, for self-interest, temporary groupings. And individuals cannot exist without constant interchange with other individuals. And that becomes joyful only when the soul emerges, the self-giving becomes joyous, when the movement is from the soul. As long as we are living in the mind, which is constantly separating, dissecting, analyzing, and putting things together. It is always by patching things up, putting things together, trying to see the bigger and bigger holes. It is a multiplicity struggling towards oneness, but mind by very nature cannot experience it. It can conceptually conceive it, but it cannot have that experience. The mind is not the basis. It cannot arrive at that experience. Therefore, the necessity to go beyond the mind to the soul within, the evolving soul within, which gives that connection with the other. Recognition of the self in the other as the sacred divine self, which I recognize and to which I offer. And this happens at small scales in say within a family, a mother and child, there is spontaneous bonding, that connection. But with people who are beyond our family, such connections do not exist. We can feel with our intimate close network, that closeness connection, when there is a soul connect. Beyond that, we do not have. There we have more of a practical, strategic alliances, negotiations, or war to conquest. Now, extend this to the scale of nations. Nations are again bound by national egos with its own self-interest. And many nations are predatory in its nature. 
exploiting other nations and living on others life energy sucking the life of other nations and it is very common just last century we just came out of the colonization the brutal colonization but there are other forms of exploitation continuing and what we see in the world is nations competing for resources and wars for resources trade wars all from the point of view of national self interest and with tremendous intelligence at our disposal and tremendous capacity to destroy an incredible complexity that mind has created a civilization that is running on primarily the mind and its sense of separation and its incredible intelligence to understand utilize intelligence but intelligence ends up serving self interest of the nations or the subgroups within the nations so a conflict is inevitable a struggle for mutual survival is inevitable in that context it's a, a community of nations struggling against each other and this can be transformed only when nations discover their nation soul their true divine light within the nations and then the nations are able to honor other nations for what they are the genius of each nation honoring and inspiring each culture and for this purpose sherbindo also envisioned the national education though initially national education was conceived in the context of india's awakening and education for india rooted in indian values and later expanded to see that unless all nations become self aware of their nation souls human unity is impossible we can have a tightly controlled peace but it is almost like a fission reactor where high energy is generated but it's a constant conflict but it is held together by tremendous force whereas what we need is a fusion reactor where souls are merging into each other and inspired energy and light is released so nations recognizing their own light their own swadharma is a fundamental necessity and it is for this reason when mother conceived the university center dashram there was also the organization of national pavilions and their cultures identifying or bringing forth the essence of each nation by nation we need not necessarily mean looking at from a political current boundaries but cultural units held together by the true soul force of the nation so bringing together all these cultures and voluntary fusion of us nation souls and inspiring fusion is an essential condition so that was really one of the early attempts to first of all understand nation souls only when we begin to admire and see the genius of a nation we can absorb other cultures and the foundation of oregon in this context is very very central the creation of oregon itself is very central where there is a whole zone dedicated to international pavilions 
every culture and its genius to be brought. And everything merging and a universal culture emerging. And there is a little context here. When Sri Aurobindo published his uh, five dreams, the third dream was about world union. And in that paragraph, he also refers to the potential of a catastrophe coming and destroying the work, the nature has already intended to bring together all the nations, all the people towards oneness, but a catastrophe may intervene. But he says, even then, eventual result is assured. And when mother began the conception of Oroville, she already stated that it is the purpose of our will is to realize human unity. And at the same time, the world was on the brink of a, an enormous self-destruction when the Cold War was at its peak, 1966. We were on the edge of that catastrophe and Oroville was not yet there. And mother was deeply looking into that desperate situation of the world and seeing what can be done, what in order to dissolve this potential tremendous danger that is accumulating, what can be done? And there was this call from her, that aspiration. And at that point, she had the revelation from Sri Aurobindo, who said it is for this you have began, you're creating Oroville. And she explains that the power of falsehood with which nations are even collaborating to create destruction, weapons of destruction, if that power can be diverted a little bit based on truth, a seed of truth, a true collaboration for a higher purpose, then there is a chance to divert this force of destruction and to prevent war. And the idea of Oroville was spreading across the world in 66 and nations were responding and eventually all the nations came together to create Oroville. So at that time, Satpram asked mother, you see, it will take years for Oroville to be created, but our danger is now. But mother says, no, it is not when Oroville is completed. It is now when the nations are willing to collaborate, that single gesture has the power to tilt the balance on earth. And we know that nations did collaborate. And that's the incredible miracle that all the nations voluntarily collaborated to create one little city where all people can live in harmony, obeying on only one law that is the supreme truth within. That tilted the balance. And in 68, Orwell was founded. So it's not when Orwell is completed, the impact of Orwell was already happening even before the inaugural ceremony took place. That was a shift in consciousness that was taking place. And later, further, she was concerned about India 
India was going through wars and difficulties piling upon India one after another. And she was deeply concerned why this is happening. Because this is supposedly the country that has the light that both Sri Aurobindo and Mother saw as the guru of the world. And this country is struggling with all kinds of difficulties. And she looked deep into it. And then came another profound revelation from Sri Aurobindo. They say, India has become the representative of all the difficulties of the world. And it will be in India, the cure will be found. And it is for this reason you have created all of them. And mother saying that she did not know. First, she, first revelation was, it was for preventing war. And look at that absolute humility with which she is saying, I did not know. Now I said, this is for which Auroville has been created. And she refers always to the Supreme directly acting to create this. And referring to Sri though she says, Sri Aurobindo, what Sri Aurobindo represents in human history is not a teaching, not a revelation but a direct action from the Supreme. And when someone asked her about who initiated the creation of Aurobindo, she says the Supreme Lord. So it is Sri Aurobindo's action through the mother, creation of Aurobindo itself. On first hand, first of all, preventing the war and self-destruction. And then if we look at fourth dream of Sri Aurobindo, where he says the spiritual gift of India to the world will begin. And here he's creating that center where cure will be found. And we know Sri Aurobindo referring to India's work in the world, where uh, first India has to recover her spiritual experience in its fullness. Then express it in contemporary terms. Then solve the problems of modern contemporary civilization. That's the work ahead of India. And here is a lab that is created. And Mother repeats, it's a place for research. Research and continuous education. And a place based on that self-discovery where all the cultures are brought here. And she says, it is not the size that matters. It has a contagious effect on the planet. In this little lab, what happens here has a contagious effect across the world. And since it is a creation that is coming direct from the Supreme. It is like soul of a city incarnating on earth, building its body, building its vitality, building its mind. It was drawing people from across the world, each one a representative of a luminous possibility. And at the same time, it's exact opposite dark shadow. And that became the crucible, where on one hand, the light amplifies, on the other side, the shadow gets equally amplified and it has to be worked through. And this whole conception of the city, which is the center of transformation of consciousness, where she establishes Matri Mandir, the most powerful transforming power on earth. where 
we can see everything is symbolic, where the supramundal light, which is represented by the sunlight, is brought in. And four powers of the mother moving in four space directions and 12 qualities that bring psychological perfection. From there, the galaxy is spinning around, which is like the churning of the ocean of human consciousness, where the representatives have offered themselves. And by living here now for more than 26 years, I can say we are not building Auroville. Auroville is building us. Auroville already exists. Its material body, the soul is creating its material body. The soul is creating its vital body. So soul is creating its mental body. And she is shaping us so that she can speak through us, express through us. And here, one of the most amazing thing, as an Indian, when I came here, I was not so much aware of Indianness. When you live in India, among Indians, you don't realize what makes you an Indian. But then when you live among 50, 60 different cultures, you begin to see the differences. And through that contrast, you realize, oh, this is what makes you to be an Indian. And you, your own journey towards finding your soul and through your own nation soul, and through that, you also begin to see the genius of other nations, other cultures. How each culture has specialized in some or other areas. And you see when these people come together, such a tremendous explosion of creativity and diversity. And this diversity is a key to true unity. not uniformity. Uniformity is the outcome of the mind trying to order everything. And today that is happening already with the present civilization. It is primarily age of reason reaching its peak and standardizing everything, mechanizing everything. Even human beings are programmable data points. Perceptions can be manufactured and tremendous artificial intelligence is put in place to manufacture perceptions, provide consumable content customized for an individual to create their own echo chambers and drive them towards desired objectives of self-interested groups. And here is the danger of the mechanical states. And we have two major camps heading towards that global civilization controlled by an artificial intelligence system that monitors every individual standardized perfection of all the life on the planet. There is a US-based approach, the capitalistic system approaching with the survival of the fittest where private corporations are now leading the world. The Googles and Facebooks control. Winner takes it all. One global market, programmable consumers, data points. On the other hand, we have China with its state control of manufacturing of perceptions and controlling citizens and ranking citizenship. And India is charting a middle path with great minds like Nandan Nilakani, working with things like building the digital foundations of India on a decentralized foundation method with private, public, deep collaboration with data democracy. And the whole new model is being developed by India, which is 
not so much known in the world. But more and more nations are beginning to recognize what's happening in India in digital space, especially digital infrastructure, the way India is building is something yet to be fully recognized by the world. And these people, they could have been easily the greatest billionaires and richest people in the world. Instead, that Indian soul recognizing, how do I create welfare for the larger family? How do I create opportunities for 1 billion Indians? Opportunities so that there is no exploitation how technology can help. So one thing is to have godlike technologies, but the most important thing is how do you go beyond your paleolithic emotions and territoriality and animality and come from the soul that looks at the world from a point of view of how do I create welfare of all the people? And these people are bold and say, you know, when you speak about India's gift to the world, you may think about spirituality. But here, they are pioneering something in another domain altogether. Just a few months ago, things like data aggreg account aggregator, things like that were launched, which are pioneering works that are happening in this country. So on one hand, there is a spiritual gift of India. So here are two sides coming together, subjective and objective. On one side is the science of yoga that is rediscovered, synthesized, brought forth, restated for the modern times. And that is spreading across the planet. The science of self-discovery, sense of purpose to the world, to life, that evolutionary perspective, evolution of consciousness, and the process of going there. On objective side, how do we use our technologies to facilitate that, to assist that, and prevent the selfish groups aggregating everything to their self-interest and exploiting everyone else? India has a tremendous work to do, and India is on the path, confidently, building quietly. So there is, first of all, emergence of the soul of the nation. India discovering her own genius, sourcing strength from Mother India's ancient experiences, accumulated wisdom, and radiating that power, sharing that with the world in the most modern contemporary way, using all the advancements in science and technology. And that work is of great importance as India has that responsibility. This is the nation where this wisdom has been nurtured, grown, R&D for 5,000 years at least in the field of consciousness. And that work is ahead of us. So on one hand, we have individual work of our own internal integration discovering our own individual souls, then sourcing into the nation soul and entering into the mission of the nation for the world. And in his Uttarapara speech, he says, India, has, India is rising not for herself, but for the world. And the evolutionary crisis in which humanity finds itself, India has the key. And human unity is right at the heart of India, Vasudeva Kudumpaka. Right use of power, right use of knowledge. And pouring out from the souls 
delight in new creation. And Oroville is an epicenter of that transformation. Now they conceived Oroville as a cradle of Superman, the fifth dream of Sri Aurobindo, a step in evolution. And she refers to to be a true Orovillian, the specific aspect of we must prepare for the advent of new species on earth. And the work is on, and we see a world in turmoil, a world on one side, or one way of looking at the world is it is falling apart on all sides, collapsing the old world. Another way is there's a whole new world that is emerging. And what began in 1968 as Oroville Charter, Oroville belongs to nobody in particular. Oroville belongs to humanity as a whole. And that elimination of the private property and collective ownership. Now we can see that it is now a global movement. The open source culture is a transcription of, it belongs to nobody in particular, it belongs to humanity as a whole. What began in the software field is now spreading into every other field. Similarly, Oroville will be a place of unending education, constant progress. Now this is a global slogan. UNESCO speaks about it, lifelong learning. Now it's a practical necessity because the world is changing so rapidly, unless and until you constantly learn and adapt will be flushed out. Just two years ago, entire planet was given a Zoom lesson, go online, and everybody had to learn, come together, and that shifted possibilities of collaboration. Suddenly the mindset changed. It has its downsides of spending way too much time on the screen, but when the right use of technology happens, there is a greater possibility of global collaboration. So unending education, and mother speaks about unending education, even use of technology, she foresees emergence of internet, even already uh, 70s, she's referring to universal television, where people can connect through the phone and access world's best knowledge. And she refers to terrestrial education, education for the nations, national education. And it is for the entire planet. And India has gold mine of wisdom sitting here. Similarly, the work began in Oroville, say in the 60s and 70s and 80s, the regeneration of the land, green work, at that time, ecological crisis was not at all spoken about. Now today, sustainability, green work, these are global movements. In early years, Oroville was working on renewable energy, windmills and all that. Now today, it's globally established. Thing. We all must move beyond fossil fuels to renewable energy. It's not that Oroville went around the world and taught things, it's just that in this little corner, people were solving their practical problems. Through that, building themselves, opening to the force of transformation, the concentrated force of supramental transformation. And it is building practical small, small steps. And it has a contagion across the planet because at a deep level, it's one consciousness, one being. So that's where human unity is, that sense of oneness that comes with it. When you discover your true self and live from there and enlarge and widen into the universal being where you are conscious of the world while you're working your small steps on your daily life. 
and sorting out that little, little challenges, personal, collective, all that. And it has its natural contagion across the planet. So the way to human unity is not going around hugging and kissing people and sitting in circles. It is inside out, discovering your deepest truth, truth of oneness, and going beyond the ego into the universal being, that state of consciousness in which you are in sync with universal mother. And it is she who is working everywhere and through everyone. She harmonizes everything. The power of harmony, Mitra and Varuna, the wideness and harmony. That is to be lived by each one of us. That's a challenge given to us. And scale doesn't matter wherever we are, whichever little room where we sit, that's where human unity begins. Thank you. Thank you. This was very inspiring. Um, I, I don't have words now, right now. Um, everything you said was just like I said, so inspiring and moving. And uh, the way you concluded that it doesn't, human unity is not about going around the world, hugging and kissing, but sitting in your room, connecting with that universal mother and finding that harmony within through Mitra, invoking Mitra Varuna of the Vedas. Thank you so much, Manoji, for this wonderful, um, I, I, I don't know whether this word summary fits, it, fits here, but the overview of vision of human unity that you've given that, um, you know, that Sri Aurobindo and Mother have spoken about. And in that context, the role that Auroville plays. You reminded me of um, a conversation I had in 2004. That was my second visit to Auroville. Uh, the first time I had come, that was in 1991. And then it was a long gap. Um, I went away and, you know, life happened. Many other things happened. So it took me many years when I came back to Pondicherry and went to Oroville. And on the way back, I asked um, someone, do you think anywhere else this experiment called Oroville could have happened? And the person said, no, only in India. And I, I still remember how I felt when, you know, that during that conversation. And it really gave me that sense of what India's work is just with that one small little exchange and after coming from um, Matri Mandir. So yes, the vision that Sri Aurobindo and Mother have given us for the work that we Indians have to do, that India has to do. And um, so everything was so beautifully synthesized in your, um, this talk, this lecture. I, I, I mean, this was just very, very inspiring. So if there are any comments or thoughts or questions from others, um, we'll take those now. Namaste, Malaji. Uh, it was a really inspiring lecture. Yes, I have been, uh, I mean, uh, from a very early, I, just when Auroville was formed and when I was, I visited Ashram in 1971, when I was just in first year in my college. And I was really, I mean, I didn't know what uh, the things went on in me that I used to stand uh, right where the corner where the, the Auroville office used to be there, just uh, by the side of the school corner. And I, in my time, I used to spend there only most of the time and I used to, stand at the corner and look at the balcony. And I, I mean, I had a real urge that I may sometime come to Orville and work and try to devote myself, but that it didn't happen. And I had to take a long cycle anyway. The thing that I had a lot of 
hope and everything and of course i whenever i go to pondicherry and visit all of them things are you but what i have vision i mean the vision of shurvinda and mother but they had is it that yeah, that we, we are far from isn't it that we are far from the reality and I, even i find that we in india even don't know what is or will we have not one of my friend classmate i mean a south indian he lives in madras he asked me basu uh, i want to go to orville and see so he said okay no problem you go and uh, also no i can stay for a day at can i not get when well, not that's not possible you have to go once and then the second time so but i feel that this the educated people even in india they don't have that sort of thing that such a great thing such i don't know what awakening we even in india have and just i just want to make a comment that uh, <clears throat> that isn't it that um, that our collective life isn't it that still shallow and empirical that to just vision such great things by sri arbindo and mother who has taken such initiative i have gone through your all these fast forwards and all it so we yeah, but at the grassroots level it i mean it's very shattering and considering the present crisis in ukraine and i am receiving i have friends in ukraine and in belarus they are giving such conflicting stories the facts that i am really at a loss to find out to know what is right and what is wrong and such complexities as there of course it's a uh, yeah but i just want to you to highlight such, uh, such salient points and such consolation so so that the situation is very disturbing i mean and i have been discussing it in my friends circle and and the people are in a really in a very loss and a days yeah, the main in a difficult uh, question the most important thing for us to acknowledge and recognize is that our mind cannot really know that's hard to understand accept see in its uh, reality mind cannot know it can pick up some pieces here and there analyze all that once you are able to see through this limitation of the mind then you are ready to drop that very attempt to know what is going on through the mind because our current attempt to know what is happening in the world or in your community or even in your personal life through the mind and its analysis it's inadequate instrument so if you really want to know what is happening the method of knowing has to be developed without it all knowledge is just a superficial fragments that we gathered from here and there and they conflict with each other and nothing fits together so the mode of knowing going beyond thinking to the deeper depth of our being where the psychic being guides reveals what is the truth for you in this moment and progressively reveals the wider picture that is unfolding in the community or in the world and you would know in the silence of your depth that is truth and it will be giving you your own small area of responsibility and work where you do it with that most sincerity dedication and self giving that little perfection that we bring into action where we are able to bring in the divine presence remember and offer make everything a consecration through that true knowledge will come 
without it we are just groping in the mind and judging things that we have no clue world looks like a big mess from our normal human perspective you do not know how the divine is masterminding everything and only when we come in touch with that deeper consciousness or higher consciousness the vision is revealed the true seeing happens and every moment is as perfect as it can be because in every moment we are one with the origin of all things with the source it is only in our mind we think that we are all so far from the ideal far from the divine far from everything and we create that picture in the mind and shut ourselves in that and make that into a justification for continuing with our inertia lethargy and compensate it by having some debate with somebody or other unless we enter the path of sadhana and leave aside all this mental constructions and all that noise going around in the name of knowledge and open to the light from within there is no true way of knowing and doing and enjoying the sunlit path that's what i would say thank you any other thoughts or comment um namaste i've just been uh, so inspired and it was a very similar kind of a thing about the limitation with respect to the mind because uh, the mind is like uh, this lens that uh, that is conditioned to just look at only a few kind of things. like i was going through this one literature called manasolasa which is a commentary on dakshinamurti and in that uh, the human conditioning or the mind has been uh, um, uh, equated or it is like figuratively told as though it's a lamp on which there is a lid which kind of like gives different patterns but the light within is the reality and so at this point of time the mind is only patterned with uh, trying to looking at things as oh is this a conflicting thing or is it a not is it something which does not have a conflict but i cannot see that which is making these things appear at the same time and that uh, it's a very fundamental thing and that was uh, that thought was coming to me so much when you were answering and it was uh, uh, confirming my understanding and experience of uh, studying that thank you so much i would just like to thank manoj da very much that for accepting this invitation and i'm sure this is going to help many of us and many individuals come out of their narrowness and as you said towards the end that it's only the sadhana that is going to take us to the true knowledge and thank you thank you so much anushtha and thank you beludi also for this initiative thank you yes we thought you were the best person to talk about uh, because see there is a there's a way to understand this vision of human unity by reading shrivindo's book and then there is an inner inner um, understanding or an inner experience that goes behind you know explaining so in that sense um, we knew that you would be the perfect person to talk about this thank you so much i wish to thank you once again manoj ji for accepting our invitation and coming here and uh, we look forward to maybe having you again on some other interesting topic thank you so much namaste